This is the Digging Deeper podcast, where we engage in today's questions from a Christian perspective. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Dr. Hugh Ross. He's uh, got a PhD in astrophysics. He's been a pastor for 46 years, and he's the founder of Reason to Believe. So we're super excited to have him here. Um, And today we're going to talk about are faith and science compatible? But um, we'll open up with there. What would be your first answer to that? First answer would be yes, they are compatible. Yeah. So, but if you want more details, I'm more than happy to share that. Yeah, break it down. So, or what? um, I guess I think you know culturally, there's there's obviously the question comes from this sense that generally a lot of people may think no, they're not compatible, and there's or you know I've had conversations with friends who are kind of um, sometimes even consciously they're just like well there's faith and there's and there's reason, there's science, and I just kind of put these in this box and that box, and they don't really touch, and I just think that's the way life is. What what do you do when you interact with someone who has well, that mindset? When you look at Psalm 19 and Romans 1, it basically is uh, declaring the two books doctrine, how God reveals himself in an utterly faithful, trustworthy way through the book of nature and the book of Scripture. And the Reasons to Believe organization I founded, what we do is we take emerging discoveries in the book of nature to bring people to the book of Scripture Mm -hmm. into a relationship with Jesus Christ. So uh, I've just finished 22 books where we talk about uh, the two books and how the books uh, are not separate. They actually overlap. They corroborate one another. So it's like two expert witnesses at a court trial affirming what each one of them is saying. And so, and we're saying they're internally consistent. There are no contradictions within the book of nature or the book of scripture. And the book of nature sustains the book of scripture. The book of scripture sustains the book of nature. Okay, that's really cool. I like that, the two books, um, breaking it down to that sense. It's actually part of the uh, Belgic Confession. So it's in the creeds. Okay, God wow. has given us two books. Yeah, I definitely didn't know that. So what, I mean... I am not a scientist, but I've been presented with the um, discrepancies generally painted, just these broad sense of there's a discrepancy between faith and science. And I think, honestly, the place my mind goes first is miracles um, as far as there being, well, how do these coexist? Because in the book of nature, water doesn't change into wine, whereas in the book of the Bible, Jesus changes water to wine, or, you know, you can just go right to in the book of nature, when you die, you're dead. And in the book of the Bible, you know, Jesus, the whole point is that Jesus came back to life. So what, what, obviously these are questions you've addressed, Sure. (laughs) but what, like, what would you, what is your response to that? Well, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I was uh, born, raised, and educated in Canada. Mm -hmm. and uh, Christians are hard to find in the big cities of Canada, which is where I was growing up and being educated. But I got interested in astronomy when I was seven years of age. But I was reading four or five books on astronomy and physics uh, almost every week from the age of seven onwards. And by age 16, realized of all the different explanations for the origin and history of the universe, Big Bang cosmology was fitting the observations. And I knew if it was Big Bang, the universe had a beginning. Mm -hmm. If it has a beginning, there must be a cosmic beginner. Mm -hmm. So starting at age 17, I went on a quest to find the cosmic beginner. Mm -hmm. Didn't know really where to look, so I figured, well, uh, Immanuel Kant is called the father of cosmology. I'll read his books. So I read Critique of Pure Reason and a few other of his books and said, yeah, this really doesn't seem to fit from what I know to be true from uh, the universe. And uh, then I began to go through the world's religions. I looked at uh, Hinduism first. It speaks about an oscillating universe model, Mm -hmm. which I knew was not compatible with the observations of the universe. Mm -hmm. Looked at Buddhism and realized it's founded on the same cosmology as Hinduism. I looked at Islam, Zoroastrianism. I looked at all kinds of different religions. But finally, I picked up a Bible. And when I tell people I didn't really get to know Christians until I showed up at Caltech to do research on quasars, that was to actually have a significant spiritual conversation uh, with a Christian. I did see two Christians from 30 feet away when I was 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And they were businessmen that came into our public school. 
and put a couple of boxes on her teacher's desk and left without saying a single word. But in those boxes were Gideon Bibles. So I'm a Gideon convert. I started reading a Gideon Bible after I went through the other holy books. And when I realized this book teaches that the universe has a beginning, it teaches that the universe not only has a beginning, but there's a beginning of space and time itself. And that was significant because that was a time when physicists in South Africa and Britain were beginning to develop the first of the space-time theorems. Mm. I'll be speaking about those at the conference, okay. how those theorems prove that not only is the universe uh, has a beginning, space and time have a beginning. Mm. And the Bible declares the laws of physics don't change. So it kind of gets to your point about how scientists say there are no miracles. Mm. Well, the Bible tells us the laws of physics are constant. And so we would not expect mm. to see any interruptions in the laws of physics. Now, the Creator uh, can do that. So when the Creator made the universe, He created it from beyond the laws of physics mm. and space and time. When Jesus walked on water, well, He's the Creator. He's not subject to the laws of physics. But everything in the realm of nature is subject to the laws of physics. But that means we can trust uh, what we see in nature. If the laws of physics don't change, we can trust our measurements to reveal truth about the natural realm. And then the book of Ecclesiastes and Romans and several other texts speak about this law of decay, how everything is decaying. And uh, you know, when I speak about this, I just tell people, look at one another, we're all in the process of decay. Uh, it's everywhere, everything is decaying. And uh, then the Bible tells us in 11 places the universe is expanding. And I realize if the universe is expanding, where it's expanding from a space-time beginning, under a pervasive law of decay, what we call the second law of thermodynamics, that's a universe that must get colder and colder in a highly predictable way. So one of the data graphs I'm gonna show uh, in the conference is the biblically predicted cooling curve for the universe and actual measurements we astronomers have made of the past temperature of the universe. Wow. And it's a perfect fit. That's insane. So that's what finally persuaded me. Uh, these other holy books contradict what we know to be true mm -hmm. about the realm of nature. Everything the Bible says about nature uh, is accurate. And moreover, it predicted future scientific discoveries. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody knew about Big Bang cosmology in the scientific realm until the 20th century. But you got Bible authors thousands of years ago declaring the fundamental features, what we now know to be the Big Bang creation model. Mm. And then I looked at uh, Genesis chapter 1. Uh, it's a story of a chronology of creation. It describes 10 creation events. And what I recognize at age 17, the first time I picked up a Bible, is these events are all correctly described and they're all in the correct chronological order. And this is way beyond the scientific knowledge of Moses and his generation. Mm -hmm. So that's where I drew the conclusion. Mm -hmm. The predictive power of the Bible to accurately predict future scientific discoveries uh, is only possible if the Creator inspired the human authors of the Bible. Mm -hmm. So that's what motivated me after a two-year study to sign my name in the back of a Gideon Bible committing my life to Jesus Christ. And then I ran into people who thought there was a problem uh, between the scientific record and what the Bible teaches. Mm. So I've been dedicating my life to basically telling people uh, science is not the enemy of the Christian faith. It's mm. the ally of the Christian faith. Let me show you. Mm. That's awesome because I, I think that idea is pervasive in, I mean, I guess in my experience in the church is a lot of fear of, of, like, of the, the disjoint ability those two things. Well, I had an advantage. I mean, in the Canadian public education system, I was taught the scientific method in grade one. Mm. I got it again in grade two. We got it all 12 years. Mm. And I didn't pick up a Bible until I was in grade 12. Mm. Uh, but when I did, I immediately saw the scientific method, even on the first page. I mean, step one of the scientific method, don't interpret until you establish the frame of reference of the point of view. Step two, don't interpret until you establish the starting conditions. What's well, all laid out in Genesis 1-2. Mm. 
the Spirit of God as hovering over the surface of the waters of planet Earth. That's the frame of reference from which we're to interpret the six days of creation. And then it says it's dark on the surface of the waters. The waters cover the whole surface of the earth. The earth is empty of life and unfit for life. But now the Spirit of God begins to work. Well, I've run into a lot of people who think Genesis 1 uh, is total scientific nonsense. I says, well, from what frame of reference are you interpreting the text? And they say, well, God's up in the heavens. It says that's not what the text says. It says the Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of the waters. If you put the frame of reference above the clouds of the earth, I would agree Genesis 1 is 100% scientific nonsense. Put it on the surface of the earth with the right starting conditions, it's a perfect fit. So what, what makes the difference if God were in the heavens? Well, a lot of scientists will say, how can you believe this book, the Bible, when it says there's no sun until the fourth day mm -hmm. and no stars until the fourth day? And I said, well, uh, it uses the word create in Genesis 1.1 and that there is no Hebrew word for universe, but it has this idiomatic phrase, the heavens and the earth. It's used 13 times in the Old Testament. It always refers to the totality of physical reality all matter, energy, space, and time. Mm. So when you see that phrase, the heavens and the earth, that's the universe. Mm. So Genesis 1-1, God creates the universe. That includes the creation of matter and energy. Mm. So there's light pervading the universe. The reason why it's dark on the surface of the waters is the clouds will not let that cosmic light through. Mm. It says that explicitly in a parallel creation text in Job. Job 37, 38, and 39 give you a much longer description of the six days of creation. And what it says in Job 38, 8, and 9 is that God had blanketed the seas with clouds that kept the seas dark. Mm. So there it's explicit why it's dark on the surface of the waters. Not because there was no light in the universe, mm. but because the cloud layer blocked out visible light from coming to the surface of the earth. A good example of that is Venus. Venus has an atmosphere 90 times thicker than the Earth. Mm. The only visible light that penetrates to the surface is at the very deep red end of the spectrum of light. Mm. Earth began with an atmosphere three times thicker than Venus has today. Mm. That would not let any visible light through at all. It would be completely dark on the surface of the Earth. And what you see in Genesis 1-3, let there be light. It doesn't use the Hebrew word for create. Mm. It doesn't use the Hebrew word for make. God created the light in the beginning. But it says, let there be light. That's when light for the first time is able to pass through the Earth's atmosphere and reach the ocean. And this is where photosynthesis can now begin. So I interpreted that at age 17. It's saying the origin of life happened at the beginning of creation day one. Mm. Then you get to creation day four. It says, let there be the great lights. Again, it doesn't use the word create or the Hebrew word for make. It's let there be. Mm. And this is when the atmosphere goes from translucent to transparent. And, uh, you know, one book, I don't know whether they're going to have it here or not, Navigating Genesis, mm. I describe an experiment that physicists performed in 2018 where they took the atmosphere of the Earth and varied the oxygen content according to what we see in the geological record. Mm -hmm. And basically discovered that when the oxygen content is below 1%, our atmosphere is so hazy, you can't even see two feet through it. Mm -hmm. Light will penetrate, but you can't see anything beyond. Wow. And when they jump the oxygen content up to 8%, the atmosphere becomes transparent. That's crazy. So that distinction between let there be light is this 1% or less, and then, you know, let there be, you know, the, the heavenly bodies. Well, like the sun, moon, and stars, mm. they appear for the first time to creatures on the surface of the earth on day four. Mm. And yeah, it takes that haze being uh, eliminated by the oxygen for creatures on the surface of the earth for the first time being able to see the sun, moon, and stars. Mm. So it's not like the sun, moon, and stars didn't exist previously. Yeah. It's that creatures on the surface of the earth couldn't see them. 
And also what you notice is no animals until creation day five. Mm. Microbes don't need to see where the sun, moon, and stars are in the sky. Mm. Every animal species, critically, they have, you know, animals have these uh, circadian clocks, biological clocks, and those clocks are regulated uh, by the creature being able to determine where the sun, moon, and stars are in the sky. So if you can't see the sun, moon, and stars in the sky, you can't have animals. And notice, animals are not mentioned until after the sun, moon, and stars become visible in the sky. Yeah, wow. And it actually says that explicitly uh, in verse 16 and 17. It says, let them serve as markers to mark seasons, days, and years. And it's the animals that need to know what time of the year they're in. Mm. And so the sun, moon, and stars become visible, and now they can serve as markers, as timekeepers uh, yeah. for the animals. That's fascinating. So if I'm understanding you right, it's that, that interpretation is that, or that like when God creates the heavens and the earth, that's the universe, the sun, moon, and stars including, and then the days are just this unfurling of those things. So like the, what you're saying is like the sun, moon, and stars were there because the universe was created but not until day four when the atmosphere, is that, am I understanding well, that right? Well, not until day four are the sun, moon, and stars visible as distinct objects in the sky. Okay. Because, you know, the creatures on the earth, they look up and all they see is haze. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there are places in the world today uh, where there's so much haze from pollution, you can't see a single star in the sky. Mm -hmm. So multiply that haze by a factor of 100, yeah. yeah, you got light, but you have no idea where the light's coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, that's wild. That's really, it's really cool here. So you mentioned that you, you know, in this period, those two years of alert, searching and looking into other religions and, and answers for who created, um, that you read these other holy books and, and came to the conclusion that these are incompatible with the book of nature. This This isn't accurate. Could you give some, you know, Details about those you you just talked about obviously the Bible. Well, I being started accurate. with the Hindu Vedas, and uh, you know they make you know it, it teaches reincarnation all the way through. Mm -hmm. uh, but the doctrine that people can reincarnate and animals can reincarnate is fundamentally based on the Hindu doctrine that the universe reincarnates. Mm -hmm. So the universe is born, it dies, it's reborn, it dies again. Uh, but interestingly, the Hindu Vedas uh, actually give a number. Uh, for the periodicity of the universe, okay. 4.32 billion years. Uh -huh. And we know the universe is older than 4.32 billion years, so it got the number wrong. Yeah. Well, moreover, it talks about the universe uh, growing and then dying. Uh, but for the universe to reincarnate, you need to have a mechanism uh, that is capable of doing that. And the entropy measure of the universe uh, is 100 million times too high to permit a rebound mechanism. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even as a teenager, I realized, okay, I know how entropic the universe is. Mm -hmm. It's not going to allow uh, for any cyclical oscillating uh, universe model to operate. Is that essentially that it would, you know, that just because entropy, can you define entropy for me? Like I said, I'm not a scientist. Well... <laughs> Uh, people often call it Murphy's Law, how, uh -huh. uh, you know, things are always worse than you think they are. Everything mm -hmm. is decaying. There's a Bible verse I can give you. Yeah. John 16, 33, mm -hmm. in this world you'll have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Mm -hmm. I could paraphrase that. In this world you'll have thermodynamics, mm -hmm. but take heart, I've overcome the world. Mm -hmm. Because of thermodynamics, everything is in a process of decay. And that's kind of the principle of entropy. Entropy is the second law of thermodynamics. Oh, yeah. That as things go on, things become more disordered. Uh, so you go from order to disorder. Things become more decayed. The universe is heading towards a heat death uh, where all the hot bodies are going to flow heat to cold bodies and eventually everything's the same temperature. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, no work or life is possible. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a while. Yeah. Uh, but we're heading in that yeah. direction. And it's like... No matter what you look at in the universe, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be your own human body or your car, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your house, uh, stars, galaxies, they're all in a process of decay. 
everything is decaying. And so when you say the rate of entropy, it's, it's that the it's rate, the of, rate decay of decay is so much that it wouldn't bounce back. It would, it's, it's well, the universe is the most entropic system we can measure. Mm. So this is where we see the highest level of uh, progression towards decay. Okay. And it's so high, it doesn't allow for a mechanism to rebound the universe. Mm. And today we know the universe is dominated by dark energy, mm. which tells us that not only is the universe expanding, it's expanding at a faster and faster rate mm. as we continue in the future. It'll never collapse. Mm. It'll continue expanding. Okay. So that means one beginning only. Mm. Yeah. And that's what the Bible teaches, a single beginning to the universe. Okay. Yeah, and that was, and so what about other holy books that you, you went to from there? Well, I spent some, I mean, as I said, I looked at the Buddhism and realized, well, it's cosmology is borrowed from Hinduism. Mm. So uh, I looked at Islam and, uh, you know, I kind of refer to Islam as a Christian cult in the sense that it's mm. like Mormonism. They have the Old and New Testament, but they add extra books. Mm -hmm. But the extra books contradict what you see in the Old and New Testament. Mm -hmm. So I looked at Zoroastrianism, and it's like, what I also found in these holy books is they made statements about history that I knew were not true. Mm -hmm. um, and I also was um, uh, disappointed just how vague the language was, how repetitive it was, and it's like, if this is a communication from the one that created the universe, why would the creator try so hard to sound like, hey, uh, I'm spiritual? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, if he created the universe, that's something that's obvious. It got nothing to prove. It got nothing to prove, whereas I saw in these other holy books, they're trying to prove something. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they were so vague about history, geography, and science. You know, one of my big struggles, uh, you know, particularly with uh, the Quran, was actually trying to find statements in the Quran that were specifically enough stated that it could be put to a, an objective test. Mm -hmm. I did find some. And in each of these holy books outside of the Bible, I was able to find provable errors. Mm -hmm. Now, when I looked at the Bible, I'll admit there were passages I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. But what I did understand, I couldn't find a single provable error or contradiction mm -hmm. after two years of studying it for a minimum of an hour a day. So, yeah, I mean, I wanted to check it all out before I made any kind of commitment. Yeah, I think I'm really fascinated by just your story of being, of just, you know, that, that uh, like being immersed in the science and the book of, the book of, you know, nature and understanding and from there holding that up to these claims about the beginning and about who God is and what life is, you know, the, the fabric of what holds life together for you to say, I don't know. I'm fascinated by for the way you came to the faith in that because I I grew up in the church and and so my understanding of things was very much informed by the reality that was of like who God is and stuff, which I'm so grateful for. But it's just fascinating to hear someone who you know opened up the Bible senior year with you know your understanding of the world and and the universe and it's like. This, this checks out with what is real. Well, what I saw in uh, my science was everything is consistent and harmonious. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the God that created the universe, if he was communicating to us through some kind of written book, it's going to have the same characteristics. Mm -hmm. It's going to be free of contradiction. Everything's going to be consistent. And what really was remarkable, picking up the Bible, I said, boy, this book is written by 39 different authors. Mm -hmm. And it's like, unless they're inspired uh, by the one that created the universe, there's no way they're going to agree in everything. Yeah. And yet it was completely consistent. Mm. You know, 39 uh, different uh, authors over 15 centuries, mm. and yet it's completely consistent. Yeah. What were some of the consistencies that stuck out, stuck out to you the most? Well, I mean, the fact that six different authors speak about the expansion of the universe yet they're using the same kind of language. They credit God for the expansion of the universe. Mm. So I didn't see them contradicting one another. I looked at the four Gospels in the New Testament, and I said they're different from one another. <coughs> uh, but it kind of reads like it, what you would get from, say, four eyewitnesses and a court case to a crime. Mm -hmm. uh, you get different perspectives, yeah. but there's a way to put it together. Mm -hmm. uh, and I felt, you know, I didn't see any signs of collusion. 
you know, yeah. where they were so identical to one another, you know, they talked to one another. Yeah, like this is, again, trying too hard. This is, we got to prove that this is aligned, you know, yeah. Well, also, they were filled with statements that would be unpopular to the culture. Mm. You know, the fact that the women come to the tomb of Jesus first before the men. It's like, hey, this was written by Jewish men without the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit. That part would get edited out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and they include, uh, you know, embarrassing uh, comments about the disciples, mm. you know, about Peter. Yeah. You know, here he is, the leader of the church, but it records faithfully, uh, you know, his... Uh, his shortcomings. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I had heard that about the um, idea of it, you know, being women who who were the witnesses. Because yeah, in that in that culture, they I think even legally they weren't considered witnesses. Like a woman wouldn't in that culture wouldn't be able to go to court and say I saw this. Therefore, you know, right. so if you were trying to make something up, you weren't gonna be like, well, these women saw it because like. So I think um, the that, that internal proof is yeah. Um, but um, I was going to ask, um, oh, shoot, I forgot what I was going to say. You can keep going if you have more. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but um, when you look at, oh, yeah, so um, you mentioned the expansion of the universe. Um, what, what are those references? What are those scriptures that talk about that? Well, you won't find any in Genesis. Okay. Uh, but the oldest book of the Bible is Job. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in Job, you don't have any priests. You don't have any nations. Its content clearly predates that of uh, Moses and uh, the book of Genesis and Exodus and Numbers. And uh, what you see there is a statement in the ninth chapter. God alone stretches out the heavens. Mm -hmm. And uh, you read it in the original Hebrew. It's using the verb nata, mm -hmm. which means the expansion of what's being described. And, uh, but Isaiah uh, frequently speaks about the heavens being stretched out. So does Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. You see it in Zechariah. You see it in the Psalms. Mm -hmm. So you've got multiple Bible authors uh, speaking about this uh, uh, cosmic expansion. It does so using all three Hebrew verb forms for the verb nata. Wow. So it basically tells me these aren't figures of speech. Although there is one figure of speech you see in, uh, I think it's Psalm 104, as well as in uh, Isaiah, uh, where it says that God stretches out the heavens like one would unfurl a tent. Mm -hmm. And what I found interesting about that as an astronomer is that the reality of the universe is the surface of the universe. All the galaxies and stars are constrained to the three-dimensional surface of the four-dimensional universe. Mm -hmm. You've got length, width, height, and time. And so the fact that we have this figure of speech, it's like someone unfurling a tent. So, you know, you're backpacking, you've got this tent all in this little package, mm -hmm. it's time to set it up. You take it out of its bag, you unfurl it, stretch it out, and now you can live in it. Mm -hmm. The reality of the tent is the surface of the tent. Mm -hmm. Likewise, the reality of the universe is the surface of the universe, and that's where all the material, all the matter and energy is constrained. So that impressed me, is that even the figure of speech was an accurate mm. statement. Yeah, because I've read those, those, those phrases of stretching out the heavens, but I, I definitely just took that as a figure of speech, and I guess I didn't really know how to apply it even in general. I just, honestly, I, when I read that, I'm just like, that's Bible talk for, like, the heavens are... Well, all of, that's two of the passages. The other nine passages simply say God stretches out the heavens. Yeah. So it's simply a, a statement about expansion. Yeah, which is, that's amazing. Do you, I mean, this is just kind of a hypothetical, you know, what your thoughts are, but do you think, do you think that was just the Spirit just informing them on what's real? Do you think there was something that they saw that gave them this idea that this was happening? I mean, it's not something that they... Well, something you see in First or... Peter uh, chapter 1 is that, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit was inspiring the Bible authors to write what they wrote and how the authors themselves longed to understand what the Holy Spirit was inspiring to write but had to be content that it was for a future generation to mm -hmm. comprehend. So they didn't understand everything that they were writing down. I mean, to me, that was another piece of evidence that this is something that's inspired by the Creator because the Bible authors themselves didn't fully comprehend what they were recording. Yeah. They understood some. I mean, I believe the words of the Bible communicate to all generations of humanity. Mm -hmm. 
That's one reason why I'm reluctant uh, to read dinosaurs into the biblical text. Because, hey, we've only known about dinosaurs for the past 200 years. Mm -hmm. And as a physicist, I'm not going to read particle physics into the biblical text. We only knew about that for the last century. So, uh -huh. so given that this is intended to inspire to all generations, it's going to use vocabulary that communicates to all generations. Mm -hmm. But don't be surprised if future generations understand it to a greater depth than previous generations. All generations get something from the text which is one reason I tell my uh, theologian friends, there's no risk of ever being unemployed. <laughs> or we get to a point where we say, well, there's nothing more to learn about the Bible. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And again, I see that as another piece of evidence. It's divinely inspired. Yeah. It's a book that can't be plumbed. There's so much content in it that no matter how much you study it, there's always more to learn. Yeah. Where I didn't see that in any of the other holy books. Mm. I mean, I picked up the Quran, it's like, hey, one reading is sufficient. Mm -hmm. I've read it more than once, but it's like, hey, this is not a content-rich book. Yeah, so. and that speaks to even the verse, you know, the, <clears throat> the word is living and active. Like right. the, the ability for something to be said. And I also love that so many people, different people, and I'm sure all those people named who wrote about the stretching of the heavens, and, you know, those are different time periods over the course of the Bible's, you know, writing. Um like these different people saying the same thing and probably all not knowing maybe well, what it means. That's an interesting point because often I run into astronomers and say, well, Hugh, you're just reading this into the biblical text. Mm. You, know, you, you know the Big Bang model is correct, mm. but people living centuries ago didn't know that. And they said, well, wait a minute. I can show you writings by Jewish theologians dating back 800, 900, 11 years ago who saw the biblical text making these statements. Mm. They did not have uh, hindsight. They had no idea that science would one day prove mm. that these statements about the universe were true. And so being able to cite people like Nimonides and Nachmanides. So these extra biblical people who are referring to these writings? These are Jewish theologians okay. reading the Old Testament, what they call the Tanakh, uh -huh. and saying this is what the text says about the universe. Really? And so hundreds of years ago, uh, they were saying, hey, this is what the Bible or the Old Testament says about the universe. Wow. And centuries later, we discover, hey, uh, this yeah. is really the way it is. That's fascinating. The, the technology catches up with the revealed nature of the right. world that God's creating. That's the same. That's crazy. Thanks for tuning in. To hear more, go to digdeeperdc.com.